Hello and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. There's all kinds of family. We chose this one. This episode 214, Collateral Beauty from 2016. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe Two. And this episode is brought to you by Christmas Brothers. Cool. They give you the whole sleigh full. Design and products, installation and maintenance, removal and storage. For indoors and outdoors, let them bring your property a touch of Christmas magic so you can relax and enjoy the holiday. Shout out to the Christmas Brothers. Well, shout out to the Christmas Brothers. Welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. After the break, we'll be talking about our Christmas movie, our holiday movie for the year, Collateral Beauty. The Will Damage. Smith. Collateral Damage. Well, did you watch the Arnold movie? <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't. I watched, I watched Collateral Beauty. I, I wanted to make you think possibly. Well, I so did. we'll, we'll talk. I guess we'll talk about it now <laughs> as opposed to like later. But like, you're like, why are we doing this movie? And so, yes. I, we've told the story in this podcast before, but when we watched Song to Song for Boyfriend Material, you the entire time were like, who is this woman who looks so much like blonde Natalie Portman? Yes. And I was like, that's Natalie Portman. And like, I have hair blindness. We, I have hair blindness way more often than you, but I've never gone that far. Yes. And so you're like, why are we doing this movie? And I was like, I was trying to gauge in my head. Are you asking for a blonde Natalie Portman reason? Or yes. Or because you haven't seen it yet. And you're like, I haven't watched it. I'm like, okay, okay good. Like that. Cause like, Helen Mirren, very cl- very clearly in the movie, like a lot of the movie, but I was just like, did he not recognize? But no, you just hadn't seen it yet. But yes, no, I Helen hadn't Mirren. seen it yet. And I and when I looked it up, like I was like, okay, collateral beauty, right? Like I'm like looking it up on yep. IMDb today, which wasn't working, so uh, for some reason. And then I go to Wikipedia, and there's like I, I couldn't piece together why we were like, I was like, does this fit the brothers theme? Like nobody's really in this. I thought maybe like. Well, now that the Italian job is canonical, canonically within the Fastiverse, uh, Edward Norton technically is a Fast member. Oh, that's um, also, yeah, there you, see, that's, okay, fair. We'll talk about all that later, though, but yes, but yes, Helen Mirren Christmas Vehicle, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Collateral Damage. But Joe, extracurricular activities, what have you been up to since we last spoke? I actually just got back from Buffalo, and the weather wasn't as bad as that Monday night game weather last night when I was there. Did you watch any of the game? Or I see did any? not. I have a friend who was a Bills fan, and he was complaining on Twitter, and I was just like, at least you didn't lose to a team that hasn't won in 364 days, and he was like, well, the Patriots threw three passes, and I was like, well, that complicates things, because <laughs> that is uh, embarrassing, but no, I did not watch a single second of it. it. Okay, it was so bad that, like, there was a punt that, like, went up in the air and just died. Like I've cool. never okay. seen yep. it before. Like a punt, like he kick, he kicks like it straight up, and it just goes like 20 yards and dies. But okay, I got back from Buffalo. I was at a wedding with Rachel's dad's niece, so it was like my in-laws' separated family, right? Mm-hmm. It was awesome. It was a really cool time. Cool. They're great people. They're super friendly. They're just a great bunch, and uh, they were all staying in the same hotel as we were. And so um, we would like you know hang out with them at night, and we played Cards Against Humanity, and we played um, Trivial Pursuit which was a lot of fun. We played cool. uh, the Battle of the Sexes Trivial Pursuit, where we each played as a team of boys versus girls. So there was four of us guys and seven girls, and it came down to the wire. So that was fun. Um, and mostly just drinking and doing that. Came home, watched some sports. I saw that you had a terrible Sunday. I'm sorry about that. Oh, it's fine. It's, I, yeah. yeah. It yeah. was People expected. Apologizing. It's just like, I don't, if you've watched any of anything, it's, you know, the Vikings, it's not It was year, the so. most Vikings-Lions outcome of the Vikings-Lions game. And also yep. the Steelers tied the Lions. So, like, I, I'm right with you, but Well, the Vikings also almost lost the Lions the first time they played. Yes. Them, so it's not new. It's, you know. <laughs> exactly. So there's that. Um, Steelers had a riveting end of their game. So I was a little bit excited about that. Ben is going to retire, which I'm very excited about, if you know. Steelers are out here tweeting about Tokyo Drift. St- yeah, Steelers out here tweeting about Tokyo Drift. Chaos all around. A pretty decent weekend. I'm in a pretty good mood. And today, I told you a little bit of what had happened. You want to save that for the news, or you want to save that for now? Uh, I'll, s- I'll save it for it's the news. It's not really news, but it's news-ish. Okay, yeah, I'll save it for the news. That's what I've been up to. What about you? I have not done so this this weekend is going to be some cool stuff that we'll talk about next time. Uh, this past weekend I did not do much. I saw two more movies in 
theaters, I think. I saw Come On, Come On, which is What's a that? new kind of art film. It's Joaquin Phoenix and Gabby Hoffman, who you've seen her in a bunch of things. But Joaquin Phoenix is a new movie by Mike Mills, who did, like, Beginners and stuff like that. Um, it's this black and white movie. It's one of the, like, probably front runners for Best Picture. So if you do watch the – if you do your Oscar thing, you'll see this at some point. Okay, cool. I thought it was good. Uh, I did not like it as much as everybody else said. Like, it's not really – like, nothing really happens, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, like, I was kind of hoping for something. I don't know what I was hoping for, but it was just, like, whatever. So, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I think it's good, but I just didn't love it. And then I saw on Saturday, uh, Benedetta, which, I don't know if you heard about this, but no. this has got, it's been protested by, I don't know. It's, like, a blasphemous, sort of, like, sexy nurse kind of movie by Paul Verhoeven, who did, like, RoboCop and... Is it sexy nun movie or sexy nurse movie? Sexy nun movie, sorry. Sexy nun. That's right. Sexy I've heard nun. about the, I've heard about the sexy nun movie, um, from one of my mom's friends, like, a couple months ago, and she was, like, all excited about it, so... Yeah, so it's good. Um, it's not as scandalous as I was kind of hoping for. There's also another movie that came out this year. It's not a sexy nun, but it's another kind of blasphemy nun uh, called Saint Maud, um, which is really good. Like, I like that one a lot more than I liked Benedetta, but Benedetta's good, and, you know, it's uh, kind of sexy and creepy and weird and, you know... It's not, you know, it's it's a it's a far cry from like Total Recall and Robocop that we did for this show, and yeah, even yeah, yeah. L, which you put out like five years ago, was great, and this is just good. But yeah, Benedetto was good. It's just it's crazy because it's not rated. Like I don't know. I think movie theaters Ooh, just like yeah, whatever. Like, just please come here. Yeah, but it's like yeah, I don't know. I mean, it would have been R. Like I don't think it's like wildly not R. But is there anything else? I started watching Midnight Mass. Did you and Rachel finish that? Yeah, we did. We really liked it. How do you feel about it so far? Where are you? I'm at? a I, I, I was going to say I'm a third of the way in, but there's only seven. I keep thinking there's nine for some reason. I've seen three, so the first big twist happened. People love this guy. People love Mike Flanagan. I think Wes loves Mike Flanagan. Rachel loves him. I liked Bly Manor. I really liked Hill House. I really liked Dr. Sleep. This one I, I'm, I'm liking so far, but I feel like it's two. Because I all of his stuff, it builds to things, so I feel like it's hard to really kind of judge yes. it before I'm too far in. Kevin was it. talking about that when we were talking about it. He was like, this is about, this one's about family and this one's about what, you know, a grief yeah. or whatever. Like mm -hmm. they all have like an overarching theme. Yeah. Yeah. Nico loves, he loves those. And I'm sure Kevo does too. And it's just, uh, people love these. And like, it's just, I mean, it's, it's really well done. Like I, I had been watching Solar Opposites. I don't know if anybody listens, watches Solar Opposites, but like my friend told me to watch that. And like, I liked it. I didn't love it, but I, I really, I went from watching an episode of Solar Opposites to watching one of these. I'm just like, oh, like it's so much, the quality is just so much. I mean, they're going for different things. <laughs> yes, obviously. Yeah. One's animated, one's not. Yeah. It's like a prestige drama, kind of like whatever. And then just like dumb dick jokes with aliens. But like, I'm just like, oh, right. Like this is, this is where I belong sometimes. You know what I mean? So yeah, I feel you playing more Halo and Forza. I've not really done a ton, but again, this upcoming weekend I'm very excited about, so we'll talk about that next time. But cool. we have a Patreon page. Too fast, too forever .com. Shout out to Cassie Wilson, Jake Freer, Ben Milliman, Nick Burris, Alex Ellen, and Justin Kleiman, and Brian Rodriguez of Ooh. High School Slumber Party, Haley Gerbys, Wes Hampton, Christian Larson, Jerry Robinson, Dan the Duke, Hayden, Renato DiDonato, Michael McGann, Lane Middleton, Lindsay Lewandowski, and Jessica Collins, aka Montez. Montez. Thank you all so much for supporting us at the $5 level or above shout out to brian who was in uh pittsburgh this weekend sending me all kinds of updates it was very cool to see him in my stomping grounds he was also at a wedding i was at a wedding in buffalo he was at a wedding in pittsburgh i think the city charmed him a little bit i mean obviously yeah. you know i'm a big fan you've been there before but he i have been he there had never he had never been there and he and he seemed he seemed pretty pretty excited about it so that's cool that's pretty cool. I was proud. I, you know, I mean, I think the city raises a bunch of like uh, brand ambassadors. And, sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you won't shut the fuck up about it. So, I mean, exactly. I wouldn't call you a brand ambassador, but you are uh, very vocal about your love for Pittsburgh. Exactly. But I, I'm not the only one, and I think that you know that that love is spread around with a bunch of people. So it's always good to see people like I, you know, like. I, I sell it hard and to see somebody else go there and be like, this place is pretty cool. I'm like, oh, good. The, the the only thing that I have, the equivalent is like people like New Jersey is a state. Like a lot of comedians, like a lot of people <laughs> I really like are from New Jersey, but it's just like, yeah, like I'm excited, that, but it's not like a place. Like it's just like, cause New Jersey is like the, everything. Like it's, it's yeah. anywhere you, if you want like urban, if you want like city, if you want like boondocks, if you want farm, if you want just ocean. suburbs, like ocean ocean everywhere yeah. but yeah there's not like the same kind of like pittsburgh has like the yeah we mine steel and we're tough or whatever and right it's three, just like three rivers 
Two Brothers and Three Rivers. But exactly. yeah, shout out to Brian. I also know, I'm not going to tell tales out of school, but I was talking to someone who listens to the show who was also very charmed by a different Midwest city. So Midwest winning over some uh, patrons and listeners of Too Fast, Too Forever this weekend. So shout Ooh. out to the Midwest. Shout out to the Midwest. We're going to do a bonus episode, I think probably before the next episode is out. So before we do Fast and Furious, Fast and Furious, there will be a bonus episode. So if you want bonus episodes, if you want to pick movies for us to watch, if you want stickers and swag and merchandise, all that sort of stuff, too fast, too forever.com. Thanks again to everybody who supports us already. Because I'm thinking about it right now. Just to give you guys a heads up, because it's early, I'm going to get this in before the episode comes out. New Year's Eve, CNN broadcast. Oh, yes, I good. just have yes. to say it. So just keep it on your radar. Put a little alarm in your phone. Anderson Cooper and Andy Cohen, watch them get blitzed on tequila and say ridiculous shit on TV. Just getting yep. that out there early this year. Yeah. Good job. Doing the Lord's work. Thank you. We also have an email address, family at cageclub.me. We've got a couple things. They're both very short. But first off, we have a Patreon update. What? Lane edited his pledge from 5 to $10 because he really wants to watch us, make us watch a couple different movies or whatever. So cool. shout out to Lane. Thank you, Lane, for doing that. Thank you, Lane. It's very much appreciated. Thank you, brother. I knew that he sent he sent one in because the patrons all know next year's two themes. So he sent in one that could either work for this lap or for one of next year's laps. TBD, which one he picks it for, I'm not sure, but we'll have to follow up with that. But uh, yeah, some good stuff coming up. Cool. And then the other email we have, it's a very short one, from Justin, back from vacation and so Ooh. on and so forth. Yes. He says, subject line, I hate hearing that there are no emails in the mailbag. And then the entire email just says, hey, guys, I promise I'm going to write in. Oh, well, thank you. Well, he was really busy. He's been all over the place. He was uh, sending me messages. He had a little bit of chaos coming back from his vacation plane wise but i he's home and safe so that's good news and uh yeah hope he enjoyed i mean it. people writing into the show i think is unusual for most podcasts it's it's my favorite thing about this show which i please keep doing it but like i get like when people don't want to i understand that yeah it's, no it's also pressure. a busy time of the year but yeah. i do like when people write in so family at cageclub.me and and i think it's it's actually kind of like morphed to like i mean like Everybody's still talking to us. It's just like maybe yes. not a formal email because, you know. Too fast, too forever.com and mailbag at cage. Or no, family at cage club. I mean, Jesus. Mailbag goes to a cage club. I'll still get it, but family at cage club. I mean, is this one. Yes. Please. And thank you on the store. Too fast, too forever.shop. Cannot guarantee Christmas delivery because I don't know how anything works. So just do it or don't. I was thinking like <laughs> we're we're not big enough for other people to like know about us and like buy people who listen to it like stuff. And so like – it's not like a Christmas gift kind of thing. It's just like you're, you're a Christmas gift for yourself, right? Like it's just yeah, it's treat it's like yourself. it's also such like a weird niche thing that like even your significant other wouldn't know about the shop. Exactly. Right? Like yeah, it's not like Lenny's gonna be like, oh, I want to get Ben a two faster. Like she's not listening to, this. she's not thinking about this, right? Or like no, Mrs. West not. getting West something. Yeah. So yeah, they would be like, yeah, like, but if you bought it for yourself, they'd be like, oh, they make t-shirts. That's cool. You know, yeah. like yeah, makes sense. Joe, on the streets, news about the Fast and Furious. It's not news about the Fast and Furious, but please hit us with your thing first and foremost. I want to send you the picture to match. So as oh, you the updated know, one. Okay. as you know, we have been pushing turbos for tots. Yep. I got it. It's sending over right now. Oh, wow. That's the whole load that we got for the um, Fast and Furious toy drive. All Fast and Furious toys, I'm going to be donating them to the 96.1 PLR toy drive, which is the New Haven uh, classic rock station. They run a big toy drive. They're doing a thing on Friday, so I'm going to drop them off Friday morning to them. Do you see all the cool stuff that they got? By Very the way, nice picture. Yeah. Also, you, talk about the one that you sent me this morning, the first one, the big one. <laughs> okay. So not well, big in terms of just like physical size, not in terms of importance, but also I guess kind you of see in it in the middle, right? Yeah. Also, the, the the one in the mid right is also huge too. Like these are okay. big things. So the Spy Racers toys are obnoxiously big. Okay. Um, first, there's like a Hot Wheels hauler, and the like that Hot Wheels car in the corner is normal Hot Wheels size. Yeah. Yeah. So this thing is fucking massive for no reason. This the was... hauler is probably like 18 inches long and <laughs> yeah, like yeah. six or seven inches tall and probably four inches across. Like it's enormous. <laughs> it's enormous. I sent you the picture today because I got one box. I was like, oh, here's some of the toys. It wasn't some of the toys. It was one of the toys. It was the hauler. So yeah. um, yeah, that thing's obnoxiously big. Also, the the Spy Racers toys are huge and in different scales. Like the the, yeah. the, the Cisco truck is like half the size of to Tony Toretto's charger car, like fake charger, whatever. Right? Ion Thresher. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That. 
And they both make noise, by the way. Like, they have, cool. like, a button for, like, lights and noise. It's really cool. I'll send you a video of it. But, yeah, the, 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 the like, all the Spy Racers toys are fucking wild. I have no idea why they made them. These are the only three I could find because I felt like it was kind of our duty to buy Spy Racers if, toys. If this show was more family-friendly, I would say you should put stickers for the show in with all the toys. But, oh, like, yeah. We don't. We, we shouldn't do that. No, definitely not. Not a, not enticing children to listen to this, for sure. Not family-friendly. The, the, so I'm going to drop all these toys off. And I think that's cool. It's, it's like a nice gambit of, you know, big ones, small ones. We'll post the picture. Rachel posted the picture for me, so it actually looks nice, and you can kind of see what everything is. So Yeah, and also shout-out to the patrons, because we used uh, Patreon money. We, yes. This is, we, we, you, you splurged in a way that we have not splurged in the past, but uh, yeah, I uh, spent pockets more money and empty this year. But I felt like, I feel, hey, with inflation, you know, this, it should happen. So There's kind of deflation. I think things like it's things are worth less now than they were. Okay, but, you know, times are harder, so... I get it. Sp uh, splurge a little bit more, but this is a nice haul of toys, and I'm excited to drop them off. Hopefully we create some new Fast and Furious fans, and somebody else watches Spy Racers, because those people deserve it after making six seasons in two years. Yes, and reminder, this Friday, <laughs> yes. as it comes out, season six <laughs> will be available on Netflix, so go watch that. Yes, so that's my On the Streets news for today. The only other thing is that friend of the show, Melissa Lynham, sent me a thing from Entertainment Weekly that Jason Statham is returning to a Guy Ritchie movie called Operation Fortune, but Fortune, Operation Fortune, not Operation Fortune, as I tried to just slur there. Operation Fortune, Jason Statham and Guy Ritchie, but kind of, of cool. note to you, it looks like the female lead in this movie won Ms. Aubrey Plaza. Oh, like, I feel like Statham and The Rock are, they're, they're family, they're in the, the Fast and Furious universe, but they both make sometimes too many movies. Like, when Vin makes a movie, or if Paul was still alive, like, when he made, if he made a movie, he'd be like, okay, we have to cover this. But, like, sometimes they make, like, six or seven a year, which is like, well, okay, we'll see what we do. Um, I also saw a post from 50 Cent today saying that he was with Jason Statham in The Expendables 4. Cool. Uh, um, See, that's what I mean. Yep. He was like, hey, need somebody to fix your franchise? Call Jason. Need somebody to, like, kick some ass? Call Jason. And, like, he, like, had all of these things that we kind of say about The Rock all the time, and he pitched Jason Statham as the exact same guy, which kind of makes sense, because kind of makes sense, right? Yeah. Oh, this whole movie is called... Operation Fortune Ruse de Guerre, which means ruse of war. So I don't know. It's a sp it's a spy movie. It's Carrie Elwes, Jason Statham, Aubrey Plaza, Josh Hartnett, Wonder Hugh what Grant. Character, wonder what character Jason Statham's going to play. Orson Fortune. He is. Oh, Operation Fortune, and his name is Fortune. Okay, cool. All right. I'm on board. <laughs> yeah. Wait, in theaters in January? And promo started today. <laughs> I don't know. May probably not, but in theaters January 21, and then the year. I don't know, man. Who knows? <sighs> Who knows? Movies are weird. Like, Encanto is already going to be on Disney Plus, like, in a week. So, like, shit just, like, it's just, they're like, hey, it's out. Missed it? Here it is. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's it's wild. That's all the news I got. It's not even really Fast and Furious news. It's just adjacent. In front of the show, Melissa Lynham sent it in. So, shout Thank out to you, her. Melissa. If you have news you want to send in, family at cageclub.me or put us in social or whatever. And we will share it on the show. So thank you, thank you, thank you. But the final thing to do before we take a break and talk about Collateral Beauty is the Fast and Furious Minute. So this, it's a yeah. TBD title because, depends on the trivia question as it has been lately, but Minute 39, Pockets Ain't Nervous. Any chance of cop trouble? No, I'm buying you a window at a time, but it's not going to be open very long. You make it. And I'll personally hand you 100 Gs at the finish line. Make it 100 Gs a piece, Poppy. Look, man. Obviously, your pockets ain't nervous. Hey, hey, hey. Don't ever touch me. Oz are empty. Like I said, we hungry. I got an idea. Why don't you two boys join us at the club a little later tonight? Yeah. Pearl at midnight? We get to know each other a little bit better. All right, sounds good. We'll see you tonight. See ya. So in this minute, Brian, Roman, Monica, and Carter continue to walk in Carter's property. They stop walking as Carter fills them in on the rest of the job they're hired to do. Roman negotiates with Carter over how much they're getting paid, asking for double. Carter has the idea to meet Brian and Roman at the club that night. Brian and Roman begin to walk away as the minute 
ends. And Joe, I said this to you on Facebook before we started recording. I can't wait to leave Carter's house. I am so excited to get out of Carter's house because I watched this minute 10 separate times at least and learned nothing. There was no background. It's all faces, a sparse dialogue, and they're in the same place they were the last minute. Yep. I do have a cool fact, but I kind of wanted to save it and it'll tie into... Did you go through all the stuff yet? No, not yet. I have some notable moments. You, you have a thing for the trivia question or for what? It's kind of, and it ties into that and all the things. So let's go through the minute first, and then I'll give it to you at the end. So there is, so we talked about this with Brendan on the last episode about Roman used to be the hungry one, and now Han's a hungry one, and Brian and Roman's no longer hungry. But it's noteworthy here that he is not only saying, you know, pockets ain't, uh, pockets ain't nervous. Yes. But, you know, obviously the hungry thing, we hungry in this line, mm -hmm. in this minute, but he also is literally eating food. He's the only one eating, so he's hungry both literally and metaphorically, right? And where did he get this food from? Did he, like, carry it down from the... Well, like... I'm assuming it's just, like, that it's almost in real time, that, like, he le they, they left the table in the last minute, he just grabbed something, and he's just snacking as they walk. So maybe some of, like, the, in the like, either the papaya seeds or the blueberries from inside. I guess so. Launching. He also reaches for Carter's pockets in a way that feels very aggressive, very, very aggressive. If somebody did that, I, I think about this a lot that like they like kind of make it seem like Carter's like touchy or jumpy. But if anybody did that to me that like wasn't Rachel being like, I, my hands are full, get my keys out of my pocket, I would be like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, like, I, like, he's just, like, he's just messing around. Like, he's not doing it maliciously, but he's basically, like, if, if he doesn't stop, like, he's gonna put his hand in Carter's pocket <laughs> or, like, just, like, tap the pocket. You know what I mean? Like, look, yeah. there's nothing in there or whatever, but what are you doing, man? It's aggressive. Very, not very even, And not even, like, in a homophobe. Like, I don't think that it's homophobe. I mean, it might be, uh, there might be undercurrents here of homophobe. Who knows? But, like, I think it's just, like, be Personal cool. space. Like, yes, exactly. Yeah, I think so, too. He's trying to grab his pocket, not his dick, right? So, like... I, I, yeah, I would. My reaction would be the same thing. I'd be like, "What the fuck are you doing? Like, why, why yeah. are you trying to put your hand in my pocket?" And speaking of what the fuck are you doing, that's what Brian seems to be thinking as Roman's like renegotiating. He's just like, because Carter's like, "Here's a hundred thousand dollars." He's like, "How about a hundred thousand dollars each?" And Brian's like, "What the fuck? Come on, dude! Like, <laughs> we're undercover. This is not actually. Even if this happens, we're not getting that money." Yeah, I know, I know, but it actually feels very on brand and and makes it more real. Roman being Roman is selling right. this in a way that makes it feel very real. Yeah. Just because he's he's not in care. Like, Brian's undercover. Roman's not undercover. Roman's being Roman. Yes, correct. In a situation that he knows that, like, he's working with a cop, right? Well, remember in the first movie, we know that Brian's meal ticket is his cool demeanor, right? So that's, he's he's selling himself here too. Whether it's with Dom or with Carter, his, his meal ticket is his cool demeanor. So he's playing the part too. It's just, it's a less, uh blinged out i don't know how to you know i was just thinking about the line uh honeys from what was it fast and furious 6 where the the auctioneer is just like uh decided Ballers. lack of honeys yes Ballers. yeah mm -hmm. that's what i think i think that brian is because we see like brian eventually evolve and become like a real person right as opposed yeah. to like this like sto like stoic cop right right but roman is just being roman and that kind of sells it but he's not undercover he's not a cop he's not undercover i mean he is like partners with somebody undercover but he's really not he's just playing fucking roman so yeah in no in no definition of the word can you say that he's a cop it's just he's just undercover he's, he's an undercover like, i don't even think that he's undercover like i would make an argument that he isn't he just like is along for the ride like yeah okay fair enough. he's playing roman pierce like he's playing a True. criminal or like he, like True. he doesn't even change his name like brian at least gets like brian o'connor brian spilner right like we get like the whole fake thing he, sure. he doesn't even get one of those he's just fucking roman pierce so yeah the only other thing i want to point out is that there's a very dramatic scene from below camera angle when brian and carter shake hands i don't know why this is here other than like johnson it's a great was like, shot. Hey, is it or is it just like why are we doing this <laughs> i think it's fun because it it makes the movie feel a little bit goofier to me and there's like one nice cloud up there it had to be one of those things where somebody looked up and was like this cloud's like right there like, yeah, maybe we should use that. That's kind of cool. And, like, and that's what they did. Yeah, but they put the camera down and they shake hands, like, across the camera as it stares up that's into so the weird. sky. It's, yeah, you're right. It's pretty weird, but I like it. But that's all the things that I noticed in this minute. Monica has a hand fan. There's a new song on the score, The Job Negotiated. These titles for these score songs are very blase, but I have two different trivia questions. But what did you want to say? What did you want to add in here before we get to the trivia questions? So I have something cool. It, it's not going to come up for, like, a 
couple minutes. That's why I'm like, eh, I don't know about this. But here, I want you to check this out. I'm going to send this to you. And this is a great influence of my choice of question of the two that you have there. Okay, I'm looking. The Pearl Champagne Lounge, yep. the nightclub that they say that they that they should meet in that, is a real place called the Pearl Champagne Lounge Okay. in Miami. So I think we should use that question and then also use other Miami club names of places that oh, I've sure. been to. I think that that's just more fun. I was also thinking if we do that. So the two trivia questions that I had, number one was, what's the name of the club that Carter and Monica plan to meet Roman and Brian at? Yes. The answer is Pearl. Yes. The other question, I'll explain my thinking here. How does okay. Roman describe Carter Verone's pockets? And he says, pockets ain't nervous. Because the, the the line about pockets is pockets ain't empty, right? Like, pockets That's ain't good. nervous. I agree. I, I absolutely agree. I mean, agree. we could do both. But so for Pearl, I was thinking, like, we could say, like, Diamond or something. But what are other some other Miami club names? No, Space, which is still a club. You could do Live, which is a club in Miami. Or my favorite club that has changed names 50 times since I've been there, Amnesia. Do you think that Amnesia keeps changing names because they can't remember what it's called? <laughs> no, no. It's like at the bottom of South Beach, and it's really small. It's like it's it was my favorite one, and they would always have really, really great acts, and it's tiny. We would go to a bunch of the other ones, Space. What was the fucking other really big one? I forget the name of it. And they also obviously all change names all the time. There was like one that had like circus like fucking things in the air, like in the middle of it. That was pretty crazy. Amnesia was just small, and I think it just keeps, like, going. It's, like, not on, like, the main strip. It's, like, down, so you'd have to, like, make the journey there. Not that it's very far, but... So we got that pearl, and then how does Roman describe... Do you want to do two questions, or do you not want to do this one? I, I really do like this one, too. Pockets ain't empty. I think they all, have to be, they, all have to, they all have to be pockets ain't something. Yeah. Pockets ain't empty. Pockets ain't nervous. But <laughs> A joke for me and you. Pockets ain't suspicious. Pockets ain't cautious, pockets ain't <laughs> empty, pockets ain't nervous, pockets ain't suspicious. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. Why are y'all acting suspicious? Exactly. I'm trying to think how we could fit that into a, a lap. It still hasn't really quite what fit. Is it? Maybe one for what next year, from? but Spring Breakers. Oh, yeah. Skater. Why are y'all acting suspicious? That's right. That's right. That's right. Maybe one day. Who knows? We'll figure it out. Just Harmony Corn, Harmony Corn, the lap. A J Miami movies. Maybe. N neon. Well, we could also do Neon, uh, Neon releasing as well, but Miami movies would also include Pain and Gain with The Rock, so I don't know, we got we got time. Yeah, that, that would be the Too Fast, Too, that's the Too Fast, Too Furious lap. It's actors from Too Fast, also movies set in Florida. That's yeah. a good lap, I'm gonna write that down. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good idea. Good, glad we got there. You heard it here on the podcast first. Yeah, we pretty much are just constantly trying to watch Spring Breakers. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but... Where's that new movie Red Rocket in... Oh, he goes back to Texas. Okay. Do you know about Red Rocket? No, what is it about? Uh, it's Andy it's, Dalton? It's, no. Sean Baker, who made Florida Project and Tangerine, made Red Rocket. And okay. it's about a porn star who is down and out in LA, like a, a male porn star, goes back home to Texas. This movie looks fucking incredible. Okay. Like, this is one of the movies I'm most excited about seeing. It's coming out this year in some way, but I'm very, very excited to see this movie. It sounds fun to me it, the trailer is great like this is one that just like i've seen parts of and like there, there's a great cover of bye 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 the insane song oh, bye 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 that they just put yeah. on spotify today so that's great there's something else i wanted to say about this minute i think maybe not maybe maybe pockets ain't suspicious i'm excited for them to go to the like the hideout next i'm excited for them to go to the club that'll be more interesting pretty much anywhere something to look at in the background that isn't lawn and uh things watering the grass there's such an opportunity again it's not for like actual movie making but there's such an opportunity for carter's house to be like a treasure trove of like goofy shit for us to talk about on this on this oh, show yeah. and it's not like oversized it, it, spoons all of the but it, the also the thing you have to think about is that because it is an actual mansion right it's already decorated, and they rented a mansion that coexisted. Kind of like the Elizabeth Taylor mansion in the first movie, yeah. right? Except they're, like, they're just like, let's just add in folding tables and computers. Yeah, and like a wall of like pictures of the actors, right? Like yeah. it's it's like there's really nothing that exciting in that house. Yeah, it's what is the, the dirtiest TV ever, right? Like that's gross. Gross. All right, Jay, let's take a break. Let's come back. Let's talk about collateral beauty. Welcome 
back to Too Fast, Too Forever. This is episode number 214. That's 412 backwards, 214. This episode... What? 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 I just... Is 412? I got, yeah, 412, okay. 214, right? Yeah, but I, what, is 412 something I should know? It's the area code of Pittsburgh. That's why I got confused. I was like, oh. Sorry. This episode is Jesus. Collateral Beauty... Brought to you by the Christmas Brothers. Their elf ears are always open at every stage. They are on hand for anything you need. Shout out to the Christmas Brothers. Well, shout out to the Christmas Brothers and welcome back to Too Fast, Too Forever. With us tonight, we have the film reviews editor at The Wrap and the co-author of I'll Be Home for Christmas Movies, Alonzo Duraldi. Hello, Alonzo. Hello. And 214 is the Dallas uh, area code. Oh, so. that's fun. There is. Are you from Dallas? I lived there for a, a good chunk of time. Okay. Because what I learned from living in Austin for a couple of years is... Actually, hold on. Before we go further, do you have a preference between In-N-Out and Whataburger? <laughs> I've never been a giant Whataburger fan. Thank but I, I'll tell you, but I'm also not a giant In-N-Out fan, uh, mainly because uh, the, the drive through is too slow. Oh. Okay, fair. Yeah. But I, I think their fries are better than people give them credit for. Interesting. Nice. Okay. I, like I, I thought I thought having a Texas guy on the podcast, I would have a little bit of something and I don't even have that in my corner. So maybe this maybe the stream is dead. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bad Texan that way, I know. What it's fine. I I lived in Austin for two years. I don't actually get the you know, I don't I don't get to like claim Whataburger. I just like the breakfast there. What breakfast. I did notice from living in Austin, though, yeah, breakfast specifically, the ch honey butter chicken biscuit, <laughs> amazing. Burgers are good. I like the burgers, but the honey butter chicken biscuit is incredible. What I learned from living in Austin, though, or I noticed is that Austin's a 512 area code. Pittsburgh's 412. Chicago is 312. Ooh. New York is 212. So I don't know what that 1 2 is, but that's like the big cities. Yeah, in my book. Because back when you had a rotary dial phone, you oh. know, the 1 and 2 meant that you were making less of an effort. Look at that. That's a, that a very so much sense. straightforward, yes. logical explanation. Like 911. And that is probably going to be the last thing that makes sense in this episode <laughs> about collateral <laughs> beauty. So I want to give a little bit of background to Alonzo. So Alonzo is the co-host of the Maximum Film podcast. Is that still true? Or are, do you still do that show? Or I no? still do that show. Last year... You, Andrea, and Ify did a two-part episode with Mary Jo Peel about all the Fast and Furious movies. Oh, it and was a, it was a four-part episode. Four part. Wow, this is amazing. We okay. did we did all eight because we had just reviewed uh, Hobbs and Shaw when it came out. Okay, uh, but and then and nine had not hit yet. So yeah, we we spent an entire month going two at a time, uh, doing the whole, the whole schmear. When that happened, like all of our listeners were like, oh my God, this other great podcast is also doing the Fast and Furious movies. And I'm like, cool, I want to talk to all of them. So we had Drea on at the end of Last Lap. She's wonderful. We had Mary Jo on at yep. the end of Last Lap. Also wonderful. Still waiting on Iffy. But now, so we got, we were like, Alonzo, we would love for you to do a podcast. You're like, great. I'm like, which Fast and Furious movie do you want to do? You're like, I don't want to talk about those movies. <laughs> so you're a, little, you're a little Fast and Furious out. Is that fair to say? Uh, you know, I, I just, having just done it on Max Film, I don't know that I had any additional insights sure. to bring to the uh, oeuvre, yeah. if you will. So, you know. So, but instead, we found something perfect because, like we said, you are the uh, co-author of I'll Be Home for Christmas Movies which is a book all about Hallmark Christmas movies, which yes. Joe is a big Lifetime movie fan, yes. Hallmark movie fan. So yeah. this is right up his alley. And I also wrote a book about legit Christmas movies called uh, I'll Be... So, sorry, uh, Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas. Oh, well, that's a good name too. Yeah, I like that. I want to hear all about both of these because I'm looking at the one book right now and it's amazing. But I'm glad that we found common ground because we got a Helen Mirren in here. So this lap, all of our pit stop movies are doing the Shaw brothers. So the Shaw family. So we got Helen Mirren, Dame Helen Mirren, Mama Shaw in this movie as death which is great uh we'll talk about that but i'm like okay cool so we got a christmas movie we got a christmas book author here we got uh, a helen mirren movie like this it's perfect it's not a fast and furious movie but it's 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 family you know what i mean <laughs> and family is important i understand how can we not talk about family when family is all that we got, got? yeah so <laughs> we will table the fast and furious conversation till the end i do want to find out which fast and furious character you are but please first do you want to talk about the book now or are you going to talk about the book later? Because the book is a beautiful book. Hey, uh, it's so your you, show. You tell me. <laughs> so this is not your podcast, but you're like a frequent guest on this podcast on Deck the Hallmark. Is that right? Yes, I have sort of uh, honorary fifth Beatle status on Deck cool. the Hallmark. Yes, yeah, cool. these three very funny guys in, in South Carolina. They are married dads, and uh, they were all school teachers together, became really good friends. And then once they started having you know babies, they didn't see each other as much. So one of them, Bran, who loves 
Christmas and really loves Hallmark Christmas movies, thought it would be a great idea to start this podcast where they would get together and watch every new Hallmark Christmas movie that dropped in 2018, knowing that his friend Panda would, you know, was was amenable and likes the movies enough, and that would be great, and that his friend Dan would absolutely hate them. And so the three of them, you know, give you the full range of opinions on these films. And uh, the show took off really quickly. They were on Good Morning America, like the first year that they were uh, a podcast. Um, awesome. You know, mi million downloads in the first year. Like this thing really took off. These guys do not have any kind of media connections. It's just this genuinely funny podcast. These three friends watching these movies and having a great time slash suffering through them. And so, yeah, I got to know them early on. I was immediately a fan of the show and immediately started tweeting about it. I was a guest a few times the first season. And uh, yeah, then a couple years ago, it was like, hey, what if we did a book? And so now we have this book, I'll Be Home for Christmas Movies, where you get their reviews of more than 100 Hallmark Christmas movies. You get recipes and, and guides for throwing <laughs> your own Hallmark Christmas party. There's a bingo <laughs> card. There's a history of Hallmark and Christmas and TV. There's sort of their personal stories about their friendship and the podcast and Christmas. So it, it's a hoot. I've been telling people, if you have somebody in your life who loves Hallmark movies, it's a great gift. If you have somebody in movies, somebody in your life who loves to dunk on Hallmark movies, it's also a great gift. <laughs> <laughs> two important questions for you. As someone who now has two Christmas, two books about Christmas movies out there, do you have a favorite Hallmark movie, Hallmark Christmas movie, and then a favorite non-Hallmark Christmas movie? No, wait, how do I want to say that? Christmas movie that's not Hallmark. Yes. Or a favorite just Hallmark movie in general, but that's that's a less important question. My my favorite Hallmark Christmas movie is probably, it's one of the dramas, it's a film called Two Turtle Doves, um, oh. which is a film about uh, a woman who is a uh, a, a neuroscientist who, uh, in her, her grandmother who raised her has just died. She uh, has inherited the house and the grandmother has asked that before she decides whether or not to sell the house, that she spend one last Christmas there, sort of doing all the Christmas traditions that they would do together every year in the town to sort of get a feel for whether or not she would want to stay there. And then living next door is the hunky widowed lawyer who was the um, the grandmother's probate attorney uh, who is raising a young daughter by himself with the help of his brother. And so the two of them kind of bond over grief and loss, but also Christmas, but also the town. And it's really quite lovely. And um, believe me, there are so many dead parents in Hallmark. It's like, yeah, hold my beer, Disney, you know, but th <laughs> this movie, I think really genuinely digs into the notion of why the holidays can so often be bittersweet, you know, but the, we, we're feeling nostalgic and that inevitably leads to feeling nostalgic about who's not there, who is no longer with us, who created these traditions that we enjoy every year, but is now no longer around to enjoy them. So I think it does a lovely job of that. And, and Nikki Deloach and Michael Rady give really sweet performances. And so that's, that's definitely my favorite, my favorite non Hallmark Christmas movie. I mean, I'm an American. I have to say it's a wonderful life. It's a it's a great movie. I revisit it every year. It's one of the great American films, period, let alone Christmas movies. Sure. Um, you know, and I just think that it's as close as the United States has gotten to having its own a Christmas carol. Makes sense. Yeah. In fact, in a lot of ways, I think you could kind of draw a line between A Christmas Carol to It's a Wonderful Life to Home Alone, because they're all movies about people who are being sort of shown an alternate life, uh, and and you know maybe having making a wish that they that they that they regret having made, seeing what that would look like, and then you know learning about to appreciate what they've got. Yeah. Now, have you seen Home Sweet Home Alone, the new one? I have. And Is it good? Uh, well, I enjoyed it, but I don't have a, a dog in this hunt. Like, I was sure. already out of college when the first Home Alone opened, so it was never a movie that meant all that much to me. I didn't grow up watching it. So I was able to just enjoy it for the sheer, like, slapstick comedy happening to Rob Delaney and Ellie Kemper, and the fact that the kid is, you know, the, the best friend from Jojo Rabbit, and he's kind of terrible. And, uh, you know, and, and I, I thought that was all funny. I know a lot of people who are big Home Alone stands who find this one just sort of you know, offensive or, sure. or you know, somehow uh, uh, blasphemous. Uh, but uh, yeah, I had a good time. It's one that like Disney Plus recommended when I went on there. And then I had not really heard much about it because I feel like it's not, again, not exactly my demo. But then I had a friend who said it's genuinely hilarious. And I was like, whoa, like this is not a friend who like is effusive with praise about many things. Oh, funny. And I was just like, oh, okay. My last Christmas movie question to you. Do you have a dog? Do you care about the whole Die Hard? Is it a Christmas movie? Is it not? Or are you just like, do you care about the argument? And if you do, where do you land on that kind of thing? Uh, I don't really care about the argument because I published 
you know, uh, uh, have yourself a movie little Christmas in 2010. And I put an image from Die Hard on the cover. So as far as I was concerned, it was settled back then. Sure. Uh, I, I think I, th I can't believe we dredge this thing up every year. I think it's very cut and dry. Absolutely. It's about a couple who, you know, uh, amends their relationship woes on Christmas Eve. Exactly. The, fina the finale of the film involves gift wrap. The heroine's name is Holly. I, it's it's yep. all there. I think the thing to, to, to throw at people now is to remind them that Eyes Wide Shut is a Christmas movie. Yes. And that opens a whole new conversation. Yes. I mean, Eyes Wide Shut's a great uh, We Last year, we did uh, The Long Kiss Goodnight, which is a great Christmas movie. Oh, yeah. Iron Man 3 is a great Christmas movie. Like, mm -hmm. all of Shane Black's movies, I think The Nice Guys even takes place at Christmas partially. So The, just... the very ending, yeah. Kiss Kiss Bang Bang is totally yeah, a Shane wonderful. Black Christmas joint. The First Lethal Weapon. It's I there's, there's so many. So have yourself a movie little Christmas. Please and thank you. And also, yes, Die Hard is a Christmas movie, and it is the best one. So there we go. Start <laughs> and stop. So Collateral Beauty, actually, no, I, I take it back. Collateral Beauty is the best Christmas movie. <laughs> Joe, had you seen this one before or no? Had you heard of this movie before? I had not heard of it, nor had I seen it before. I want to say congratulations. You've once again convinced me to watch a Christmas movie. It is something that I have many, many, many questions about. Sure. So now, Alonzo, you had seen this before because we had a conversation about the screenwriter, I believe, right? So, you, but you were familiar with this movie. You had seen this movie. Yes, I saw it when I went to the press screening when it came out, Jesus, and a, okay. a a distinguished critic whom I will not name was so annoyed by this film afterwards that she pounded the walls of the theater as we were walking <laughs> back to the lobby. I saw this in theaters, which I saw. So I, I didn't pay to see it. I had a movie pass at the times, so but I saw this in theaters and I sort of forgot about it until I was like, what Christmas movie could we do when I found this one? And then, you know, we talked about it and I'm just, I'm very excited we're talking about it here. But yes, please go on. What else, what, what else is your history with Collateral Beauty? Yeah, it basically sort of launched my love affair with my least favorite working screenwriter. Uh, <laughs> and that would be uh, Alan Loeb, who after seeing this film, within a very, a relatively short amount of time, uh, I, saw two other films based on his scripts. Um, one is a film called The Space Between Us, mm -hmm. um, which on our podcast, Linoleum Knife, we always refer to as Candy Bones, uh, because it's about a kid who's born on Mars and wants to come to Earth to meet a girl that he likes, but the change in atmosphere means that his skeleton is very fragile. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then a movie called The Only Living Boy in New York, which apparently is the movie that kind of put him on the map in the first place. Like, it was somehow a hot script when it sold and it got him these other gigs. And what I discovered in watching these three movies is that he he, he does the same shtick every time, which is that he loves to throw around a lot of philosophical concepts that sound deep but are not. Okay. And he loves to throw in a twist at the last minute where two seemingly unrelated characters are totally related. Oh, my God. Did you see that coming? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. He also, for for reference, wrote a couple Adam Sandler movies. And Adam Sandler and that sort of, that crew, he wrote Just Go With It. He wrote Here Comes the Boom, The Switch, The Dilemma. He wrote the Miley Cyrus vehicle, So Undercover. So, like, there's a lot of things here that Alan Loeb is... He wrote the he wrote Rock of Ages, the Tom Cruise movie, which oh is my. not good, but I enjoy. Hey, he's, so get, he's getting paid. Good on him. He's yeah, getting exactly. paid. So I, I think we get a sense early where where uh, Alonzo falls. But Joe, what did you think of the collateral beauty of it all? So you know that sometimes I have problems following movies. I was fucking glued to this movie. I don't know <laughs> what it was about it, but I was so fascinated by trying to figure out where they were going, how they mm -hmm. were trying to get there, wh why all these actors agreed to this movie. <laughs> yeah, there are like six <laughs> or seven legitimately huge actors in this movie. Yeah. This is a Will Smith starring vehicle. Yeah. Edward Norton, Kate Winslet, Michael Pena, Helen Mirren, yep. Kira Knightley, uh, and Naomi Dowd Harris. is great. Naomi Harris. Like, there are so many, like, oh, 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 okay. That's we're going to need a bigger doing. marquee. <laughs> So my brain's doing this the whole time, and then so and then we get to the end, and with like the really cheesy twist reveal, I was like, okay, uh -huh. I'm sold. Like I, this yeah. is a movie that I won't forget. I will definitely remember the plot of this movie. So I was sort of snarky about this movie when we were previewing it last week. So I'm like, oh boy, Collateral Beauty, and I remembered it being like kind of hated by a lot of people. Then I found I was like, but there's something about this movie that I can't quite put my finger on defining I don't know if I want to say why I liked it but like what 
tickles me about it in a certain way. And then I found a list by this letterbox user named Lantana, L-A-N-T-A-N-A. Okay. And they write, the, the title of the list is The Collateral Beauty Cinematic Universe. <laughs> and okay. they say, these are films that reach the apex of being batshit insane, emotionally saccharine, or socially inept, or a combination of all three very entertaining watches. And the first three movies on their list is Collateral Beauty, yeah. The Book of Henry, <laughs> and Serenity, which are two of my all-time <laughs> what-the-fuck-how-are-these-movies movies. I've seen about half these movies. It's, it's She's spot on. Or they're, they're spot on. It's amazing how... These movies, like, nothing makes sense, and yet everything makes sense, and everything's confusing, but also everything is straightforward, and it's like, is are they? Is that actually going to be his Oh, that is his wife. Okay, got it. Yeah. Yes, they're talking about the same thing. Yeah. 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 I, I, there's, in, there's no shortage of run-of-the-mill bad movies, but yeah, when you start talking about your collateral beauties and your books of Henry, you've reached a whole other uh, strata of... Like, what are we even doing here? Who thought this was a good idea? Yes. Did, did, they, did they watch the dailies and think, oh, yes, we've got this? You know, but but there is, and yeah, Serenity, absolutely. These movies do exert a certain kind of fascination where you're like, what are we, what, why, how, who, yeah. you know? I, I will say, if anybody is out there rightfully loving and watching Succession, if you want to see Kendall Roy, Jeremy Strong, Playing a character named The Rules, go check out Serenity. <laughs> uh, the, the Matthew McConaughey, Anne Hathaway, that shit, like genuinely one of my favorite movies because it's just, it's, I, 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 again, I don't think these movies are good, but I have a blast watching them because they're, again, you're saying they're not run of the mill bad. They're just, yeah, they're, they're taking swings and they're not connecting, <laughs> but they are taking fucking swings. Oh, uh, look, Dave and I just had a long conversation on one of our Linoleum Night Patreon shows about an Otto Preminger movie called Skidoo from 1968, which okay. is, it's an all-star LSD comedy starring Jackie Gleason. So, I mean, like <laughs> you, you get to watch Jackie Gleason drop acid in this movie. And so, yeah, it doesn't quite work, but boy, it's trying for something and you will never forget it and you'll find yourself watching it over and over again. And uh, and, and it's th this is this kind of bad movie. So the plot, the plot of Collateral Beauty, and I'm, I don't mean to laugh because it is a very like if you, what I'm about to say is very devastating, but Will Smith's daughter dies. Yeah. And Instantan I mean, like first first clip of the like before the title card, essentially. Yes. And then almost immediately we jump three years forward and just like, well, okay, like we're here like a minute in current time. Now we're yeah. three years later. Got yeah. it. Okay. Okay. And he is a walking zombie at work and he can't get anything done. And we can see that he's grieving. He's got something on his mind and it comes out over the course of the film that he has lost a daughter. And, and nobody frowns harder than Will Smith. No. He, he scowls. Is, the, the, the scowl, the face, and the emptiness in his eyes. He he sold this. It's good. Also, his eyes, like his the redness of his eyes, like the the the, the pain. Like so yeah. apparently while yeah. he was filming this, his Will Smith, the actor's father, was dying, and so he was like, this was helping him sort of process that. Okay. So like this is also kind of cathartic and like actual thing, but like he is going through some shit in this movie. Yeah. And it's you can see it. Um, so his daughter dies, we jump forward, his firm is falling apart because this whole thing has been built on his relationship with these other co companies, and everybody's just like, he's not doing anything, we can't keep giving you money. And so we have Edward Norton and Kate Winslet and Michael Pena all like, we need to do something. And so they find this small actor's guild, which is Dame Helen Mirren, the yes. reason we're doing this movie, yeah. Kira Knightley. And then who is the, is it? Jacob Lattimore. Jacob Lattimore. So what do I know him from? What is he, what is he best known for? Uh, this was a big thing for him. And I. Oh, he was the star of Slight. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Gotcha. Uh, and he was also in uh, Detroit. Gotcha. The, yes, uh, yes, yes, the, yes, yes. The, um, why am I Catherine Bigelow. Catherine movie. Bigelow. Thank you. Yes. And, and has also been on The Chai. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Yeah, he's he's like recognizable. I don't like I don't really know him from his, but he's good in this movie. And the three of them are like this actors troupe, like trying to stage a play. Uh, the Hegel Theater, mind you. The, which is a real place, right? No. Well the, the the venue is, but it's not called the Hegel Theater Company. That's that's a little that's that's this movie's idea of subtlety, but we'll get into that later. Okay. <laughs> okay. So the three people from the firm go and try to hire these three people 
to the idea, Edward Norton's idea, <laughs> is what if love, time, and death show up in person and answer the letters that Howard's been writing to them? So Will Smith, in his grief, is writing letters to these, like, anthropomorphic ideas and about how, them. like... And mailing them, putting them in a mailbox. Yes, and with a stamp. No return, yes, no, no address, <laughs> it's just, like, to death. And <laughs> yeah. mails them, and just, like, you failed me, I'm dead inside, or whatever. Like, all this whatever. And I realized at this moment, and I put this on Twitter, that this idea that <laughs> Edward Norton has is essentially a Nathan for You plot. Yeah. <laughs> where he's just like, the plan? What if Love, Time, and Death show up in person and answer the letters that Howard's been writing to them? It's just like, this is, it shouldn't work. <laughs> And yet, well, it somehow does. Th th this is a movie in which, first, the movie tries to convince us that this isn't just an advertising agency. This is a place where ideas are purveyed and love is spawned. And, like, They're family. They, they, all this fancy, fancy talk, but it's an ad agency. Let's not kid ourselves. And then, be, to save this uh, uh, ideas and love ad agency, you basically <laughs> have Will Smith's three closest friends in the world like trying to gaslight him into signing over the company to him by to any means necessary. Yes, and and and, <laughs> and I love. You can tell this movie was made in 2016 before Donald Trump got elected because the movie has to stop and explain to us what gaslighting means. Yes, 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 yes. yes. <laughs> Yeah, Helen Mirren's like, the play Gaslight? Oh, come on. You don't know Gaslight? Come on. Gaslight? Very, very soon we would all know. But back in the, when this movie came out, it still had to be explained to us. Yes. <laughs> the, the big twist of the movie, which I almost want to say, but I think we have to say it just to have the thing. Oh, it's is been these, five years. I think we can spoil it. I know. Well, we're going to spoil it no matter what. But I, I almost <laughs> I wanted to save it for the end. It's on Netflix. If you don't want to have this spoiled for you, go watch it on Netflix. It's 97 it's minutes. It flies by. It is. But we find out that these three actors they hired are are actually <laughs> love, time, and death embodied. Dun, dun, Helen dun. Mirren is not just playing death. Helen Mirren actually is death. She's the ghost of Christmas death. But she's also death pretending to be a vain actress, which is like the, my favorite part of the movie. <laughs> yeah. It's also true. Yeah, yeah. And so not only is Will Smith writing to these three things because they talk about how these are like the three things that drive advertising campaigns people it's love it's time and death i'm like well okay sure whatever that's maybe whatever they, yeah, they, they seek love they want more time and they fear death yes and so not only is will smith writing to each of these embodiments of whatever but each of his three best friends in the world are all grappling with something that michael pena is literally dying from a disease yes Kate Winslet has focused too much on her career and has not had time for family. Yes. And so she's run out of time. And Edward Norton, like, slept around, I think. And yes. Like, got caught cheating, and now his daughter doesn't want to speak to him, so he needs love in his life. Yes. And <laughs> what his daughter's a instead going to see Hamilton with Odell Beckham Jr. Yes, yes, yes. That was one of the greatest lines. I, I, so Rachel Rachel was at the store. She comes back, and I was like, expl like, we were at the scene where he's, like, picking up his daughter from school or trying to pick up his daughter from school, like, near the end. And I was like, oh, that's his daughter that hates them. And she's like, okay, whatever. I was like, yeah, because, you know, she went to go see Hamilton with Odell Beckham Jr. And she's like, what? And I was like, that's an actual quote from the movie. That's really what she said. <laughs> with mom and Brian and Odell Beckham Jr. <laughs> yes. like, what? Yeah. Why did you name drop Odell? I don't know, but awesome. Mom, Barry, and Odell Beckham Jr. Sure, uh, whatever. Yes. Cool. They're all helping Will get on with his life, but also helping themselves in the process. And it's unclear if this advertising agency really survives, because it, it doesn't matter. It's like, <laughs> they're all better off. Michael Pena is going to die. I genuinely don't like that. That ad agency might fold, like, a, no. a month after this movie ends. And what a loss that would be for all of us. <laughs> they were saying that, no, they were going to get the buyout because the buyers were going to overpay for a dying agency and keep everyone on staff with full creative control and their jobs. Yeah, that's how business. That's how business works. Yeah, exactly. Well, in, Hall in Hallmark movies, it works that way all the time. <laughs> <laughs> the movie establishes that Will Smith is the only one here that really is good at his job. Pretty much, he's keeping this place afloat, but then he doesn't because he leaves. Yeah, I mean, Love writes a better tagline. That's, that's than, exactly than, what I'm getting than to. Edward Norton does. <laughs> <laughs> so they're doing like a casting call for this like cruise line or whatever. And the line that Edward Norton has not only written but is like in love with is basically something like. 
if you want to find your life, you first have to shed your skin. And it's like, yeah, all catchphrases are like very long and wordy. <laughs> and Keira Knightley is online like to get cast. And she just says, shed your skin, find your life. He's like, that's not the line. And he's like, wait a minute, that line's way better. And then I'm like, clearly, like, how do you not? But like, he's like second in command at this massive ad agency. And he sucks at writing copy. Like who, what is this business? I also want to highlight a moment that happens here, which is that after he steals that line from her, he opens the door to an office and yells, hey, Frankel, David Frankel is the name of the director of this movie, <laughs> and uh, which I did not catch the first time. And I heard it last night. I thought, oh, God, a new reason to hate this movie. <laughs> so in universe, the director of the movie is casting a commercial for is a cruise a, line or is a flunky in an ad agency. Somehow, yeah. Yes. Also, Will Smith's obsessed with dominoes. That's a whole thing. Uh, because late in the film, you see like a home movie or a flashback or something where he and the daughter would yes. do little domino things and knock them over. So now he's, of course, doing these incredibly elaborate domino things, which there's no way in an office you could spend. They talk about how he spends days and weeks building these things. At some point, somebody's going to come in there with a vacuum cleaner and ruin the whole thing. Oh, you just for sure. Know it. Or someone's going to sneeze, or like there's going to be like a, a, anything. A it's truck like, yeah, will this drive by. Yeah. He's not taking up just like his desk at the. It's like like three quarters of the office space that they have. He's got a full conference room going. Yeah. One of the things I think is like a little bit. I mean, it's very over the top, but I think in comparison to the other things going on in this movie that I genuinely love is the soundtrack. Like the score is never not like building, and there's yes. never like a release. <laughs> it's just like this is all crazy. Like though it's scored like the entire thing is a montage, which it kind of is because there's a lot going on in 97 minutes, but it just keeps building and building and building, and I never hear it like release. It's just like building and building and building, and then building and building. It's just like when are we gonna like be able to breathe i think edging is the word you want here. yes we are it is edging <laughs> it the entire is time edging. and then boy does it deliver <laughs> <laughs> just to get i want to circle back to the hegel theater company because okay please like, he he hegel is a famous philosopher and his to 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 ridiculously oversimplify his stuff. His notion was that pure concepts are grounded in reality itself and not subjective to what people can sense or what their impressions are. So the idea that these abstract concepts of life, of, of time, love, and death would be, would be, would hide out under something called the Hegel Theater Company is another way of this movie trying to like let you know how deep it is, man. I yeah. love movies like this. This is, this was something that I was thinking about whole, the whole time I'm watching it, is that I really love movies movies that try to just hit you with how deep they are instead of actually being deep am like, i blowing your mind man? yes it's like the, the like the pretentiousness of trying to write something like very deep but doing it badly is something that i really enjoy seeing in film well then this is the movie for you <laughs> yeah it always comes across like you're like you're like <laughs> near the end when they're like getting ready to set up the reveal that they actually are time and death and she's like i guess i just ran out of time you know and he he's like like all of these things where you're like okay come on man like you're just you're just edging me to the end of this for another five <laughs> minutes when we know what you're doing here so oh, i really did enjoy that and then, you know, sorry, not not to step on your plot synopsis, Joey, there's a whole other character to deal with here, which is that every so often, Will Smith will show up at a support group for yep. bereaved parents, for, for people who lost their children at a very young age. Yes. At first, he can't even go in. He, like, looks through the window and sees it and doesn't go in. Eventually, he, he enters the room, but, like, when they ask him the name of his child, he, he can't deal with it and he leaves. Finally, he starts talking to Naomi Harris, who's the woman who runs these groups. Uh, you know, she keeps, she tells him over and over again the name of her daughter who died and, and the rare form of cancer that she died of. Mm -hmm. and yes. how she was six years old and she'll ask Will Smith and he just, he can't, he can't, he can't. And she'll talk about how, you know, she asked him if he's one of the people who gets divorced after a child dies because statistically that happens a lot and how it happened to her and how it wasn't necessarily they fell out of love, but that when they when her husband left, he left her this note saying, if only we could be strangers again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how to phrase what I'm about to say, but like I kind of understand somewhat the sentiment, but I also don't understand like literally what that means or what he wants it to mean or what the screenwriter wants it to mean. Like, I mean, I, the idea being like, if only we didn't have all this baggage of a yes, dead child, exactly. maybe, we could we could, love again. maybe we could make a go of this. But as is, sorry, bye. <laughs> okay. 
yes. And that's when they walk under the bridge with love, time, and death, looking down <laughs> at them, and they look back, and then they're gone. And then you realize that the woman who graced Naomi Harris as she's watching her daughter die is... With the terrible title of the film. Yes. Which they use... Just the titular sure notice. The titular the title beauty. is said yeah. multiple times. Yes. And repeat it twice in the first time that it's said. And, and it's it's funny. It reminds me of the, there's a there's a great terrible. Speaking of movies that are like so incredibly terrible, you have to watch them over and over again. There's a 1968 movie with Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton called Boom, uh, based on a uh, later Tennessee Williams play. And they are like drunk and overacting like mad. But part of the movie's heavy sense of poetry is that Richard Burton's character will just periodically go. Boom. <laughs> the shock of each moment of still being alive. And at one point he says it and Elizabeth Taylor just responds, Boom. <laughs> and and I do love the fact that when 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 Naomi Harris is telling Will Smith the whole story about the old lady at the hospital, you know, telling her about, oh, keep an eye out for the collateral beauty, he's like, the hell is collateral beauty? <laughs> yeah. 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 I did not look this up. Was that a phrase in any way before no, this movie? No, no. It's just it's the a, opposite of collateral damage. It's another thing that, that for, it's another Alan Loeb creation to where he can be like, am I blowing your mind with my heaviosity? Yes. It's a catchy phrase. It doesn't really make sense. It doesn't, It like so much of the big ideas in this movie, it doesn't mean anything when you think about it for a second. Sure. But it sounds good. It's just like, I guess... The definition would be all the beauty that happens while other beauty is happening. Well, you know, look, it's it's like there are there there are a lot of variations on this phrase you hear, like oh, there's beauty in the ashes, the cracks sure. are what let the sunlight through. This it's not a new concept. It's just the phrasing collateral beauty. It just sounds snappy, but yeah, it it basically just means like no matter how shitty something is or like how you know grief stricken you might be. Tucked in the corner somewhere is going to be some grace note that you need to look for. And it's not an entirely terrible idea, but it, it is presented in a way of like, no one's ever thought of this before. Right. And they're right. It's never, it's never been thought of before. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, kind of. Ugh. But yeah, so but then but so the big switcheroo in true Alan Loeb style is that Naomi Harris is Will Smith's ex, and the daughter yes. that she keeps talking about is his daughter too. And they were what? pretending to be strangers the whole time, so they could fall in love again. Which is also like I don't want to be stereotypical, but they like the, at the support group, it's like almost an entirely white support group, and then Naomi Harris is the only black person in there, and then Will Smith goes in and it's just like, oh, like I wonder if they know each other. Like it's movies, like what do you think, like do they belong? It's just it's this weird like not racist but like if you think about it a little bit it's kind of racist but it's also true it's the, the only other black character in the film is time and uh presumably you know the, the they 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 are not like best buddies or whatever but yeah that you would think because this this movie is one of those films where oh it's new york city what black people live here you know yeah. so like, <laughs> yep I, they do take the piss out of New York a little bit where Edward Norton's like, well, I can't really pick you up in a Tesla and bring you to your internship at Anna Wintour or whatever they do around here. Like, there's a little bit of, like, classist, like, fighting back. But also, I mean, he's second in command at a huge ad agency. Like, it feels like he could have a Tesla and could get, like, I, I don't understand exactly, like, the dynamic there. Yeah, if he's living with his mom, it's because he is just shelling out in child support so that she can continue yeah. to live in a doorman building. With a very overly protective doorman. Quite, yes. So so the, don't come the pauper with me, Edward Norton. <laughs> Kira Knightley's character's name, like her, her real name, she, I mean, she's love, but her yeah. name is Amy Moore, and Amy is mm. French for beloved, so her name means loved more, and also... Oh, her initial is A. Moore. A. Moore, <laughs> or... Uh, the way that IMDb describes that, even though that's, that's much simpler, when slurred, it sounds like a more, but it's just like an A dot more, A more. So Ugh. she's love. <sighs> yeah. Helen Mirren plays Brigitte, which I guess that's death in French. I don't know. Probably. <laughs> no. <laughs> But Rooney Mara was supposed to be someone. I don't know who she would have been. Well, she's too young to be the Winslet role, so I guess she'd have to be Love. I guess so. But they also they offered a a role to Rachel McAdams, who is basically Ooh. Canadian Kira Knightley. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I would think that she would be that. I guess she could also she could be Kate Winslet. I don't know. Uh, and Hugh Jackman was cast in Will Smith role, but dropped out due to scheduling conflict. So like this almost was a wildly different movie. But still, these are all big name actors 
who was almost in there and who actually wound up in there. So, like, this was always, like, I guess, a hot ticket in some regard. Yeah, again, like, there was this, there was this moment where, like, I mean, Alan Loeb has been, a, obviously, a consistently working screenwriter, as you point out. But, like I said, he had this moment of, like, this kind of it boy. I don't know if he was on the blacklist or whatever, but definitely after Only Living Boy in New York, his he sold some scripts for a lot of money. And this is the sort of, like, high concept nonsense that by the time it gets into theaters we roll our eyes at but somehow on the page makes big stars think ooh let me in on this uh, yeah. I'm, I th I'm thinking specifically of another Will Smith movie although it was a small role uh, did you guys see Winter's Tale? No. Yes. <laughs> Winter's Tale where Will Smith I believe plays the devil? He does indeed. <laughs> yeah. Saw that in theaters as well. Yes. Yeah, that movie is cuckoo bananas and yeah yeah and, and part of the plot makes you uh, have to assume that uh, Eva Marie Saint is the, like, 120-year-old editor of a New York newspaper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. There was – I don't remember what it was, but I feel like there was one point where I was going to be able to fit that into a lab we were doing this podcast, and I don't remember how or why. But, yeah, Winter's Tale is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, again, memorable. Like, I saw the movie seven years ago. I still remember Will Smith as the devil because, like, they're not – I don't know, man. There's it's, a flying horse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, it, it definitely falls in that category of bad movie that you that you. It, it's like the video in the ring. You immediately have to feel like you have to show it to somebody else. <laughs> yeah, just to make sure you didn't hallucinate it. You know, that was like after I saw the book of Henry. To go back to that, I was just like, I don't know what I saw, but I need to hear what everybody else <laughs> thinks they saw. Because like, Joe, have you seen the book of Henry? No, I've never seen it. Ooh. Alonzo, it re refresh me if I'm wrong, but it, it stars like a 12-year-old kid named Henry who dies fairly early in the movie. Yes, but has and left then, a lot of cassettes behind to his mother, Naomi Watts, instructing her how to murder the cop next door. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So she's like listening to these cassette tapes and he's just like, all right, mom, I need you to breathe. Like you have the sniper rifle in your arms. So I need you to breathe because I know you get worked up. Like breathe here. And it's just like, how, what is, and like he's narrating this entire Here's like, how you're going to, here's how you're going to get an untraceable handgun. It's, yeah. yeah I, I think like the, and the, the kid's sort of, 12 or something. Yes. Yes. He's a bit oh. super genius though. The, okay. The, the writ large version of all this is cats. Like cats was the movie that yes. everybody ran out to go see because they knew they were never going to see anything like it in their lifetime. But I think on a smaller scale, a lot of these movies have that same level of just daffy there's no notes that bring you to a movie like this this is somebody's vision yeah, yeah. <laughs> when mike manzi and i i don't know if we said that on here we've talked about it in other podcasts i think but when mike and i saw cats in theaters he was like i can't do this and he like stood up i'm like mike sit down there was like eight people in the theater like on like opening day because like no it was just like nobody was there i'm like yeah. mike sit down because you will never see another movie like this in a theater like you might hate this but this is a one-of-a-kind once in a lifetime whatever this is you need to stick around for taylor swift to descend like and sprinkle catnip fairy <laughs> dust or whatever like that we need to see this you will this tell your grandchildren about this moment yeah <laughs> It's amazing. Also, so Joe, for context, um, the kid who plays Henry in the book of Henry is the main kid in It, and he's also oh. in Knives Out. So, yes. like, yeah, okay. he's like he's like a, he's an established known actor. He's been acting long enough that he's actually changed his name. Wow! For, for a long time in movies, he was known as he went by what I assume is his real name it was like Jaden Lieberher, and then now he's Jaden Martell. Some, Martell, yeah. yeah. Wow. And then also his younger brother in that is Jacob Tremblay, who is from Room. Right. And he's from like every other, like it's just these two kids are like in everything. And yeah, somehow Book of Henry made it to theaters too. And just, boy, what a wonderful specimen that is. Whew. Oh, the original director, this guy who did Me, Earl, and the Dying Girl, left the project over creative differences, which I guess he was probably like, this is batshit. I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> True. And they're like, all right, you can fuck off. That's cool. Get me the guy who directed The Devil Wears Prada. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please and thank you. Here's, I'll tell you though, you know, you, you were saying about how this is a movie that does work on a certain level for certain folks. Like, I mean, I just watched this again last night and, and spent the whole time rolling my eyes all over again. But I distinctly remember when we reviewed this on a, a, a show that I used to do on YouTube called What the Flick, like the level of user comments of like you people don't know what you're talking about i cried from start to finish yeah. this has become a christmas favorite of wow. mine you know and like look if that is your actual response to this movie more power to you like i don't begrudge anybody pleasure that they get from art even yeah. if it's yeah. art that, that i don't respond to 
I do not respond to this. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. I am, but I, you know what? Like, ignore me, watch it every Christmas, have a good cry, get all the things that you get out of it. I just think it's garbage. Yeah, we will get to that kind of sentiment for sure. I found a great review on Letterboxd. We'll play that game in a little bit. We're going to get to someone who feels that way about this. I just of the, uh, am of the mind that I'm sure I, maybe this doesn't work for you, Alonzo, in the same way that it did. I, I don't know how it worked for me, so I can't say in the same way or not. But I see so many movies that are like, yeah, it was good. That's fine. Whatever. Like three stars out of five. Right? It's just like, yeah, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Like that to me, and I don't know if this makes any sense, but there is a very fine line on like a, a on Letterboxd, for instance, between like a half star movie and a five star movie, where it's just like, it's one thing that maybe goes right or goes wrong, but like there's something that like, it's not like everything else. And this falls into that category. Well, when when my husband, Dave White, used to write for Movies.com, he had a system by which there was the half-star movie and the zero-star movie. Okay. And the the half-star movie was run-of-the-mill bad, mediocre, ill-conceived, uninteresting, sloppy, whatever, you know, just not a movie you ever need to think about again. A zero-star movie is a film that you cancel everything and run out to see while it's still in theaters for two minutes because <laughs> yes. it is next-level bananas. Yes. And so I would say, yes, on that scale, this is a zero-star movie for no yeah. question. Definitely. I like that. One of the big disappointments for me is when I think I'm going to see a zero star movie and it turns out to be like a half star movie in that yes, scale. It's just e like. Exactly. When when you wind up at I Frankenstein, you're like, Ugh. yes. But then sometimes you walk into Dangerous Men and you're like transported. Oh, Dangerous Men. I saw that at, when that premiered at Fantastic Fest and that was that was an electric crowd. That was amazing. Oh, I bet. I saw it during its one week run at the uh, at the Lemley Music Hall. And that's one of the, one of only two times in my life that the box office person actively tried to discourage me from buying a ticket <laughs> really yeah but the other one weirdly enough was near dark well that was wild near dark rules like yeah, objectively great is great well the, the 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 young girl working at the theater in nashville where i saw it in 1987 uh, would not agree apparently i disagree with her so dangerous <laughs> men joe for some context yeah is this guy, a movie that's like one guy was making for like decades okay and i think like ran out of time maybe and then like you ran out of money, stopped making it, and then died. But then I think it was either the Draft House or Agfa or something like the uh, the Genre Film Association or something. Like somebody found it and was just like, "No, there's a movie here," and yeah. they recut it and released no, it. No, no, no. It, it actually it was it was recut by him before he died. But okay. he, he did stop shooting for like a decade. So you have the same people in the movie who have now. It's like Richard Linklater's <laughs> Boyhood, where they're suddenly ten years older, still playing the same characters. Uh, but and yeah, I think he was even he might have even been alive for the first few screenings that happened in L.A. at the uh, at the Silent Movie Theater. Theater, and then he died and then yeah i think ag for one of those guys picked it up and now you can get it on blu-ray but but yes. it is this, it is this just crazy passion project those are my favorite yeah and his daughter because I, I think when i saw it he wasn't alive anymore but his daughter was there and she like she was just like so overwhelmed that like people like it's not a good movie again but like people love it yeah. because it's just crazy and it's just like this is not good but it's so much fun like you can you can feel the passion like collateral beauty does not have passion like it's not like this is like it's not like the room right where it's just like this makes no sense but like it's tommy why so like it's his vision yeah. like that's yeah. not what this is no but this is like this is a studio movie where ostensibly dozens of people had notes and were just like, yeah, this is what we put out to the world. It's like, how did this, like, that's special too, I think. Yeah, I mean, because you look at this, I mean, you look at a movie like The Room or Dangerous Man, and you're like, okay, I can see the sweat of the, yeah. you know, I can tell how low the budget was. This is a slick piece of business shot in New York City at Christmas time, big movie stars, you know, big, like, you know, swelling, edging score, like all the trappings of a real quote unquote movie and yet it's completely bonkers um, yep. but yeah somehow it just wound up this way and, and it's a movie where I think that you know, it, it, in a lot of ways, it's the high concept allowed people to think like, oh, well, th clearly this all comes together and this means something. And, and maybe you're even sort of patting themselves on the back at like, you know, telling this complex story and so deeply emotional. Yeah. And then viewers <laughs> get a look at it and they're like, no, <laughs> except for the ones that said yes, you know. <laughs> They commented on your YouTube video. Exactly. Those people loved it. <laughs> Is there any trivia, Joey, that explains why these people did this movie? No. I mean, no. You know, because no. sometimes it's like, 
uh, Edward Norton knew the director, and they called in a favor. But you're saying like Hugh Jackman was supposed to be in this. Like, th there's no explanations on like. No, I I think it's to a certain extent like what Alonzo said before that like on the on the page this is probably like a very emotionally impacting thing where it's like you know there's a good story here. It's about a guy trying to come to terms with the fact that his daughter died and his friends are doing what they think is right to help him along that path, right? Yeah. And then it just. Even though what they're doing is objectively despicable. Yes. yes. Even yeah. though what, what actually plays out is terrible. But I think it's also the kind of thing where it's just like, oh shit, like Will Smith and Kate Winslet are attached? Like, yeah, I could do, I could do that movie. It just, I feel like it's one of those things where it's just like, oh, wait, who's who's ready cast? Yeah, okay. Yeah, sign me up. Well, you know, it, it, it's funny because like, you know, Kate Winslet and Hugh Jackman were sort of the the catnip for uh, a movie called movie 43. I don't know if you've oh, seen that. Yeah. Yeah. They, Rock that movie. They shot that segment first, the one with the two of them on the date where Hugh Jackman, the, 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 the hilarious reveals he's got balls on his chin. And I will admit up front, I'm one of a handful of positive reviews that movie got because I really, laughed. I can't defend it, but I laughed. Um, but anyway, they, they shot that segment and then they showed it to the people like, well, we got Winslet and Jackman and they're huge. And so, you know, don't you want to make uh, some really, really bad taste short comedy that we can throw into this as well. And then that's how they get like Richard Gere and all these other big names that are in that Jeez. movie. Yeah. That, they were, they were sort of the, they were the, the they were the bait. So I think that's yeah, you hear Will, you hear Will Smith and, and maybe one or two other people making this movie. Then suddenly, yeah, you want to sign up for it. Yeah. And like movie 43, like that's a different, like I feel like comedy, it's just like, that just, it wasn't funny to me. Like, it's like, that's a different thing. Like it just, Oh yeah, bad comedies are just deadly. If you're not yeah. laughing, there's no way to enjoy it. But with the exception of something like Skidoo, which is like I said, in its own planetary orbit. How do but, you spell Skidoo? I tried to look it up, but I couldn't find it. Uh, S K I D O O. Oh, uh, just one I, one D. Okay. Yeah, Jackie Gleason, Carol Channing, Groucho Marx in his final film. Uh, it, it's believe me, it's like nothing you've ever seen. Cool. Uh, but but yeah, but 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 a bad drama. Or, right. you know, the, a movie that is taking itself seriously that is laugh garnering. That's a whole other brand of entertainment. Yeah. Uh, Joe, what other questions do you have or what else do you need to know about this? No, that's I, w I was hoping that there was some backstory to that. Really enjoyed the, the, again to like hammer on the symbolism. There was like on Will Smith's desk. He had this Brian Green book that they made sure you saw so many times like it like floats by the side it floats over the cover it floats like but like the camera is constantly showing you this brian green book i like the brian green books they're they're really fun they like explains like quantum physics you know in layman's terms kind of so it's oh, pretty cool. like the elegant universe and until the end yes. of time and the fabric of the cosmos okay yes. yeah, yeah 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 so like they had like one of his books on it and like and and this is kind of earlier in the movie so i was like oh, okay if we're getting like slapped in the face with symbolism like this like awesome i'm, I'm on for the ride well, it, 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 it's it's the equivalent of wearing a T-shirt with, you know, uh, a Nietzsche on it or something. Yes, you exactly. You just, you're letting the audience know that you're thinking about it. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And like this, the, like this was the inspiration for this. And you're like, uh, was it? And the other thing that I really, really liked in this movie was Edward Norton goes to his mom's house and she's just like just very demented. This is where he comes up with the idea to like just make these people real. I don't think this is something you should do to people with dementia, but he just like fully tilts her in the direction that she's go like she's like oh yeah like the what the, like the werewolves are like conspiring outside and he's like yeah i told the raccoon cia agent and whatever. He, he yes he yes ands her basically yeah exactly yeah he's doing that to her which i i don't think is pretty good but um he but when she sits down or like when he sits down he's like what is this csi cleveland she's like yeah it's a new one and i was like man i really want to see csi cleveland i think that would be a lot of fun too you know my love of shit TV, and I was like, I "Sure do." It. They're That's leaving money on the table. Exactly. Like, how did they not come up with this? It's beautiful. Anything? Any other thoughts about this, or do you guys want to watch a trailer? I, uh. My only, the only last thing is like, it's funny you mentioned the the Die Hard thing earlier. I don't know why this movie is set at Christmas necessarily. You, the, the, you know, the, the the reason that Dickens set a Christmas Carol at Christmas was there was this ancient idea that that the 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 membrane between the living and the dead was at its thinnest on Christmas. Oh. And, and that, and that's why it was more likely for ghosts to appear. I don't really get what Christmas adds to this movie apart from like art direction. Yeah. 
true. It makes the movie look prettier, right? Like with the yeah. lights and stuff and trees. Exactly. And it's it's wintry, so you get some nice coats in there and, and that kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, there is sort of this Christmas shorthand of like... Uh, emotional depth or or redemption or whatever but the movie doesn't really comment upon it ever it just sort of like like with so many other things like the Hegel theater company and the Brian Green book and everything else they just sort of throw it at you and and assume that you'll know what it means and that that you understand why it's important and and it, it will somehow deepen this underwritten screenplay <laughs> yeah <laughs> I just am glad that we live in a world, and especially in the Fast and Furious franchise world, where Helen Mirren plays death. So now I, the next time I see Mama Shaw in one of these movies, I'm just thinking about, like, what if she's actually death? Incarnate. <laughs> and, like, yeah. she's actually the big bad guy in this franchise, this universe. And Dom's always flirting with death. Dom's always Ooh, flirting oh, with death. Oh, Perfect. I like it. With, with writing that good... <laughs> How could it not be the twist in, in 10 or 11? All we need is a <laughs> whole bunch of dominoes and a Brian Green book, and I think we just wrote F FX right there. Dom, you know? Mm. All right, let's watch the trailer for Collateral Beauty. So this was posted by our, not Movie Clips Classic Trailers, just Movie Clips Trailers. Oh, posted, damn. I guess, when it came out. Wait, hold on. Did this... Because you said it came out before Trump, before it, well, it came out. It came out in 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 December of 2016. So, yeah, so Trump had been elected, but he hadn't president elect. Okay. He had he had not uh, taken the oath yet. Yeah, because this was posted in September September 2016. The trailer. So it's like okay, all right. 11 million views. Collateral Beauty official trailer. One 2016 Will Smith movie. Um, so I'll do a three, two, one play. Are you guys ready to to watch this trailer? I'm See how ready. they sell this. Hang on, I've got I've, I've got I've got to get through the Jillian Bell ad. She loves home goods so much. <laughs> Who doesn't? Who doesn't? Thank thankfully we all had workaholics so that she could shill for home goods, right? There you go. All right, I'm I'm looking at Central Park, so let's do it. All right. Three, two, one, play. To connect. To connect. Okay. Love, time, death. Now these three things connect every single human. Like the being rent the rent on this office must be like tens of thousands of dollars a month. Yeah, I mean they have I would imagine the entire floor at least yeah. of a high There's stairs too, so that there was like a second floor because they're Oh that's on right, stairs. that's right, that's right. I do love like you you can tell whoever shot this like they they went maximum cozy on that uh, on that bereaved parents group like it's oh yeah super warm in there. I do think most of this movie though is cozy. Yeah, that's true. It is for for a New York movie. It is it it's a very upscale New York and it's a very like. Yeah, it, it, it for for sure. This is there's like that one scene at the end where you know Kate Winslet has to go meet Time in the sort of you know like in a, like below 175th Street. But beyond that, the rest of this movie is all sort of Central Park and yes, and you know Central Park. Yeah. very schmancy. I do like the choice of Death having kind of like that marabou scarf. Yeah. <laughs> Very undeath like, maybe? I don't know. Well, I mean, the beret, I suppose, is meant to suggest the cowl, as is in the big reveal later where she says the title of the film, she's got her hoodie up, you know. Yes, correct. So just give her a scythe and she's good to go. So here's a, here's a semi-serious question, because I don't know, I genuinely don't know the answer. When he's talking to the people in the streets and he's secretly being filmed and they mm -hmm. sit him down yeah. and they're like... Oh, they claim that they to? they claim to have digitally erased them, which is a level of effects work that I don't know that Ann Dowd could have accessed in 2016. <laughs> okay, that's what I was trying to figure out. Like, because they're real people, but also they're also time, death, and love. So like, they could also just disappear. I don't know. Like, it's just one of those things. Like, did they have like crazy good CGI where he's like throwing the visible skateboard? Maybe. No, no. There, there's a there's a moment where where. Uh, I think Edward Norton has explained to Keira Knightley or to somebody that they're going to digitally erase them from the video. Yeah, they sell that oh, as part I missed of the that. plan. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah so, so in the other times when people pretend not to see them, like it's because Kate Winslet is in on the bit or because it's Anne Dowd and her grandson who were in on the bit. But when the, yeah, for the videos, they are somebody has physically removed them, which again, I, I think was a little ahead of the game for for the period in which this movie was made. Nowadays, yeah, I'm sure you could probably just do it on your, on your laptop, but um, you know. I think that's a bit of a cheat, but you know, it's it's that Max Headroom thing of like, yeah, the tech's not there, but we'll just pretend it is. Sure, yes. 
that trailer, I don't know. Like, it, so I see that. I don't know what the movie's about. It reminds me, Alonzo, did you see this movie this year, uh, the movie Nine Days? I have not. Um, and I've, I've heard wildly mixed things about it, and I, I have meaning to check it out at some point. It is, it's, yeah. Joe, I think I talked about it briefly on okay. this when I saw it. It's... I don't know if it's good or not, but <laughs> it's after... So there's this guy who, like, kind of exists. Like, it's the medium place from The Good Place. It's just sort of, like, limbo-ish. And a guy lives there. And when you die, you go to him and you sort of plead your case uh, about where you're going to go. And it's just kind of like a, hey, live your life kind of thing. But it's like, I saw the trailer for that. The reason I'm bringing it up now is I saw the trailer for that. I watched the trailer for this just now, and I'm like, they kind of give the same, like, I don't know what this movie's about, but I feel like it's weird and not like other things. Like, I don't think this trailer that we just watched connotes in any way that it's going to be a batshit crazy movie. Yeah. But it's just like, there's something off about that, and I don't know what it is. Like, why are there all these actors in this movie that nobody's talking about or whatever, right? Like, something is skew, askew here. Well, I think there's always an audience that you can find for movies that are professing to be about the big questions, you know, yeah. the, where do we go when we die? Where were we before we were born? You know, does love exist in a cold, uncaring universe? Like all, all these sort of like, th this is the stuff that, that Collateral Beauty pretends like it's about. Uh, and, and so, yeah, the trailer, you have to sort of try and pitch that level of, you know, oh, there's, there's big questions and there's pain, but there's also a lot of hugging. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like it, it's not like going to see an Ingmar Bergman movie where he's going to ask those questions, but you're not going to like the answers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to do the letterbox game now. So for reference sake, uh, Alonzo, are you on Letterboxd or no? Uh, I have a secret letterbox account that I use mainly to keep tabs on what Hallmark movies I've seen this year, Perfect. but I, okay. I haven't cool. really shared it. Because I looked for you before, and you're you're on there as an actor, I believe, like in like eight <laughs> documentaries. Is that is that right? I, I'm in a few documentaries. Uh, I I have one IMD credit B credit where I, I this, literally a good friend of mine was making a very low budget feature, and I went to the set with snacks, and before I knew it, I was put in the back of a shot. So uh, I think I have a credit for that too. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I think you have like eight letterbox credits. It's crazy. Wow. Let's see if he, see if this is right or not. So okay. we have. Fabulous, the story of queer cinema. Yep. The fabulous Alan Carr. Mm hmm. Pornography, a thriller. That's my standing in the back of the shot movie. I'm, I'm a video store patron. Oh. Cool. A Night at the Movies, Merry Christmas. Yep. That's a TCM special, which actually just uh, re aired over the weekend. Cool. Here's looking at you, boy. That was a thing that I did for like, it, it, I think either German TV or it's a German film. I've never seen it, but I do know, I remember being interviewed for it in San Francisco. Yeah, there's like nine people. You're, you share credit with Tilda Swinton and Gus Van Sant. Oh, well, you and know. And John Waters. Uh, you know, we, we spend the weekends together. So, you know, it's very <laughs> Clearly, you, you summer with collateral beauty. In Gstaad. <laughs> uh, stars inside in the gutter. Yes. The real story of Christmas. Yep. And then A Brief History of Gay and Lesbian Cinema. So you have eight, it says films starring Alonzo <laughs> Duralde. So like it's... Yes, name name above the title, please. You also have a bio <laughs> on here too. So really? God, I've never have, looked myself up on this. It's you hilarious. have a very long bio. You have a longer bio than a lot of other people. Oh, good heavens. All right, we'll have to see if any of it's true. I'm not going to read it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to put it in chat if you want to see it. But like that's a, that's a beefy, that's a wow. long bio. Yikes. Okay. That's crowdsource. That's on the TMDB. So, oh, okay, yeah, that I is. I was like, all right, you got some words there. I'm old. I've racked up some credits over the years. What can I tell you? Apparently, <laughs> but congratulations, you are the first star of eight films that we've ever had this podcast. <laughs> I think so. So the way we play this game. So for reference' sake, Mad Max: Fury Road, one of the most popular films on Letterboxd, has been seen by nine hundred and forty-three thousand people. Nine wow. four three. Okay. okay. Collateral Beauty, which came out in 2016, directed by David Frankel, starring Will Smith, Edward Norton, Kate Winslet, Michael Pena, and Helen Mirren. I will say right now, if you're nowhere close in this guess, that's totally fine. The fact that Joe is sometimes close is remarkable to me. I still don't understand how he gets it, but try to guess how many people on Letterboxd have logged Collateral Beauty. Well, this is that thing with like, you know, like the reason that the audience scores on on Rotten Tomatoes and IMDb don't necessarily mean anything because they reflect the people who bothered to go vote in this, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that uh, there are probably a lot of people on Letterboxd who will, would feel like they're too cool to cop to having seen this movie. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to go low and say something like 
273,000. That's that's a really high. That's still pretty high. Oh, yeah, that is go, okay. Give a what, what what do you think your guess is? I think I think I, I think Alonso's on the right track in terms of his thought process. My thought was to go high for me and I, just because of all the actors in it and kind of the fluff, I was going to say 40,000. Okay, it's somewhere in between those two numbers, between mm-hmm. 40 and 270. Joe is much closer though. I thought I'm so. sure. Well, okay, 65. Yeah, I'm going to go 55. 53,559. 53,000 people, including 11 people I follow. Scores ranging between one half star and four stars. Awesome. Will Southern gave it four stars. I removed my star rating because I'm just like, I genuinely don't know what to give it. Um, <laughs> okay. This is one where the, the rating split is almost like a straight line across. Like every digit from a half to five has like noticeable like normally it's a bell curve and this is kind of a bell curve but like from two stars to four stars is all kind of equal and there's also a lot of fives and a lot of ones so people are just like yeah i don't know all over the place covers the bases (laughs) yeah so now we're gonna go to emily sutherland's account at emily sutherland who watched this this year Will Smith again, I cried for so long after this film. If you haven't seen it, genuinely watch it. It's beautiful. Five stars. Okay. So now, actually, wait, I didn't do the other thing. So hold on. So we know that at least one, but how many people out of those 53,000 people do you think have this movie in their top four? Oh. Ooh. I'm going to say fewer than 250. I go... That's really high. I, I would go... 35. Somewhere in between, between 35 <laughs> and 250. Uh, 48. Yeah, f- 56. 56. You're both way too low. More than that. Yeah. There's 62. four choices for best movie, and more than 50 people have this as their. Okay. It's- considerably more than 50. Oh, God. Whoa. Less than 250, but considerably more than 50. Uh, more than 100? 112, yeah, 112. Still got to go higher. Whoa. 135, and that's my final guess. 138, 138 <sighs> letterbox.com users time, dude. have put Collateral Beauty in their top four. It might be ironic, I don't know, but Emily Sutherland, not ironic. If this movie works for you, it works for you, I get it. And, like, there's no accounting for when a movie makes you cry, you know? Yeah, yeah. And so, you know, that I think that that uh, I've certainly have been a case where like that just sort of short circuits a lot of my other kind of critical faculties about a movie. But, uh, I, you know, it, it's weird. This well, this is what I keep thinking about the, for different reasons is last year I went on the Flophouse podcast um, to talk about the Dudley Moore, Mary Tyler Moore uh, disaster six weeks, which is also set in New York, partially in New York City. Also about a girl who dies young and also a movie that had a lot of big stars attached to it on its way to finally becoming a movie. Like when I was doing the research on it, it you know, at one point it was going to be like Nick Nolte and Audrey Hepburn and, you know, like Whoa. all these really major people attached to it. Like the the young girl was going to be like, you know, Elizabeth McGovern or Quinn Cummings or, you know, and, um, you know, before it wound up being what it was. But, uh, but yeah, also a terrible movie, which is about tragic circumstances and so you know it 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 makes you feel like a cad for laughing at a movie that is you know so ineptly handling this very serious subject matter but we're laughing at the ineptness not at the right. subject you know yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. Exactly. it's it's not funny that that Will Smith's daughter died it's funny how terribly this movie handles everything surrounding that act yeah you're not laughing at it you're kind of laughing with it but also not really with it cuz they're not laughing it's just like somebody's got to laugh cuz this is Emotions need to come out, and the, the <laughs> yes. one that makes the most sense is, is humor. So let's just laugh for us. No, I, I, I think I think the thing about uh, supremely bad drama sometimes is that they can be about the most serious subjects imaginable. But if the handling of the if the treatment of the material yes. is bad, then it's funny. I agree. The test results are in. I definitely have breast cancer. It's, it's like that. No one says like that. Case like in what? point. <laughs> All right, so Emily Sutherland, in her top four, Collateral Beauty is her number four favorite movie of all time. Uh, Joe, number one, she wants to go swimming right now. Oh, um, Call Me By Your Name. Correct, number one. But now numbers two and three, I also picked this one specifically because her two and three, her second and third favorite movies of all time, are also Christmas movies. And they're not ones we've mentioned today. 
Uh, is one of them Love Actually? Love Actually is her number two, which is probably... I would imagine that the, the Venn diagram of people who genuinely, earnestly love Collateral Beauty and people who love Love Actually is basically like one circle. Probably, yeah, and Kira Knightley is the, the, the connecting tissue. Sure. But number three is kind of... I don't want to say it's not a... I, I, it's not immediately when you think of it a Christmas movie, but it is firmly a Christmas movie. Um, while You Were Sleeping? Nope. Long kiss it's a recent night. movie. No. No, it came out in the last five years. Mm. And it is a beloved property, I will say. Also, hmm. largely for women, but I also really love this movie. Hmm. Christmas movie. Yeah. But not. But for... Is it animated? No, it's let's live action. Like, Love Actually is like, it's a Christmas movie. Like, this is like a drama set at Christmas, oh. but also firmly a Christmas movie. Is it the 2019 Little Women? It is the 2019 Little Women, directed by Greta Gerwig. Which was my favorite movie that year. It's a wonderful movie. Where did I have that on that, my list? Let's see here. My favorite movies. Not my number seven, but my number one also had Florence Pugh, and my number one that year was Midsummer. So mm. that was a great year for movies. Holy shit, that was a good year for movies. Yeah. Midsummer, Parasite, Lighthouse, Ad Astra, Uncut Gems, Her Smell, Little Women. Holy shit, 2019. Yeah. Bringing it. Alonzo, before we let you go, I want to do one more thing. We need to sort of, it's kind of Fast and Furious, but not really. I want to find out which Fast and Furious character you are. I know that, you know, you're, you're Fast and Furious out, but do you still have in your mind somewhere a sense of who the characters are? Kind of, You don't need it for the quiz. Sure, but no, we're no. to find out who you are. It's a personality quiz. Oh, there's oh no, I there's see. No pressure. Oh, okay. I, 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 I had an answer, but if there's a quiz, then let's do the quiz. Yeah, we'll find out who you are. So I, I want to, because I just want to, I want to make sure that like when we tell you who you are, you have some kind of basis. And if you have questions, oh, we'd be happy to answer them. Sure, but there's no, no I'm... it's not trivia. It's no, you don't need to know anything. It's just who you are as a person. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm versed enough in this uh, universe. I think I can handle cool. it. Seven questions, six multiple choice answers per question. Let's go. Number one, question number one, how fast are you? NASCAR, roller coaster, Lamborghini Murcielago, Toyota Prius, Vespa, or Razor Scooter? I'll say roller coaster. Pretty fast, okay. Question number two, you know it's coming. How furious are you? The Hulk, Kylo Ren, Christian Bale in the one movie set that one time, Mel Gibson, Charlie Brown, or Jack McBrayer? Uh, I, I, this is the only time I've ever going to answer this, this way, but I'll say Mel Gibson. <laughs> I don't know that anybody has ever said Mel Gibson. It's a good choice then. Not very furious, but also kind of furious a little bit. Yeah. All right. Alonzo, question number three, we're having a barbecue. How are you helping? Are you manning the grill? Are you saying grace? Are you kicking back with a beer? Are you babysitting? Are you being the entertainment or are you sneaking a snack? Oh, sneaking a snack. You've got time to kill. What are you doing? Are you grabbing a bite? Are you working on your car? Are you hanging with friends? Are you drinking a beer? Are you working out? Or are you doing some work on your computer? Grabbing a bite. Describe your wedding. I'm never getting married, which I hope is not the answer because you said earlier you are married. So let's <laughs> throw that one out there. It's just me and my partner. It's us and our families. It's a backyard country affair. Everyone I know is there. I don't remember. <laughs> Everyone I know is there. You just won the lottery. What are you buying? Your own garage, a private plane, I'm gambling it all away, my child at home, a fleet of cars, or a new life? My own garage. Cool. And the last question, to decide everything. Mm. What is your drink of choice? Belgian ale, Corona, something fruity, water, whatever's cheapest, or just, you know, Joe's getting a drink at the bar, just get me one of whatever you're having. Water. All right. I, I have think no idea. I have no idea. There's a very real possibility you're a new character. Hold on. Yeah. Oh, no. We had... Larson was this person, but he, he took the quiz very early on. You are, for the first time in a long time, you are Twinkie, a.k.a. Bow Wow from Tokyo <laughs> Drift. <laughs> Alonzo, the old saying, don't judge a book by its cover, describes you perfectly. To say you have a big personality would be an understatement. Your style is loud, you talk fast, but that belies what you've got on the inside. You're charismatic, you love interacting with all types of people, and you're always looking for your next big deal, but you're also fiercely loyal to the people you decide are worthy of being your family. You fit in by sticking out because everyone knows who you are, but no one really knows what you're capable of. And you drive, drive like, like the, the wind, wind blows. blows. 
<laughs> well, science says so, so it must be true. You're definitely Perfect. Twinkie. That's just what that's what science says. So <laughs> congratulations, you are Bow Wow. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I will remember that for the many times that I'm asked in the future. Yes. <laughs> I mean, he comes back, so he's in two movies now, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm in universe. Yeah, you are in universe. But Alonso, thank you so much for joining us, for talking about Collateral Beauty, oh, for watching this movie pleasure. again for us. Like, that's oh. a big ask for somebody to see this once, but to watch it again, knowing what it is. It was a total sacrifice, but I was happy to do it for you guys. <laughs> thank you. I um, have a last minute question. Um, have you seen previews for the Cluster Funk Christmas, and will you watch it? Uh, I have seen some of the previews. I have it in my TiVo. Again, I'm old. Uh, but yeah, and I am totally planning to watch it. Uh, I'm a big fan of both uh, Anna Gasteyer and Rachel Dratch. I think that the tropes of these movies are definitely sitting there waiting to be mocked, and it looks like they yes. do a lot of mocking of them, so I'm pumped. Good. Yeah, same. Awesome. I'm really, really excited for it, too. I'm glad to hear you feel the the same way if you love these movies. I feel like it's something that, and like based on how you're describing like what you love about these movies, it seems like we're kind of on the same wavelength there. So I'm excited. Excellent. Alonzo, what would you like to plug? Uh, the book, podcast, social media. Where are you? Where can people find you if you want to be found? Sure. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at A Duralde. It's A D as in David, U R A L D E. Or you can follow me on Instagram at Linoleum Cast. Uh, Linoleum Knife is the podcast that my husband Dave White and I have been doing for about 11 years. You can also hear me on uh, Maximum Film on the Maximum Fun Network and on uh, Breakfast All Day which I do with uh, Christy Lemire and other folks who were on, like I said, that old show, What the Flick. Uh, and then uh, at least once a week, I'm also popping up on Deck the Hallmark. And with the Deck the Hallmark guys, I am the author of I'll Be Home for Christmas Movies, uh, which is available wherever books are sold. It's out new this year. And you can still pa uh, pick up my previous Christmas book, uh, Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas, um, <laughs> you know, wherever you get books. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Joe, the next episode we are doing on the main feed is Fast and Furious, number four, back to yes. Mexico, back to the border, back to tunneling underneath between the countries. But between now and then, you and I are doing a bonus episode for the Patreon, another Shaw Brothers movie. This is the one that we looked up, I think, on the last one. We're like, holy shit, this looks crazy. We're yes. doing The Boxer's Omen, where if you have Google image this, Alonso, have you seen The Boxer's Omen? Now, when you say Shaw Brothers, do you mean the actual Shaw Brothers who yes. did all the so Hong Kong we, movies? Oh, okay. we, we got a little cheeky yes. here. So we're doing Shaw Brothers. That's the theme for this lap. So we're I, doing I movies get it. either Clever. starring one of the one of the Shaws right. or made by the actual Shaw Brothers. So yes, gotcha. we did 36 Chamber Shaolin, and now we're doing The Boxer's Omen. Uh, I have not seen the Boxer's Omen. If you just like Google image or Bing image or whatever, just like the, it looks insane. And I don't, I haven't seen this one yet, but I am very excited to see this movie. And the images, the Patreon. like it's the clips, crazy. the clips that are like just on like any image search of it look bananas too. So oh, I'm excellent. excited. The poster's crazy. The, the stills look crazy. Yeah. That'll be on the Patreon between now and then. It's too fast, too forever .com. But for all things too fast, too forever, you go to cageclub.me, facebook.com slash too fast, too forever, or at too fast, too forever on Twitter and Instagram. Email us, family at cageclub.me. Check out our Patreon page at too fast, too forever.com and our store at too fast, too forever.shop. And come back next week for Fast and Furious. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe, too. And that was Alonzo Duraldi. And we'll tell you all about it when we see you.